there will be no seminar. Um, I'll send out an announcement saying yay or nay, and it'll probably be obvious to most people by then anyway. But um, yeah, I think that's all I have. I'm going to hand it over to Carly, who can introduce Jim, and we'll get going. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. So I'm just going to introduce Jim with his biography. Um, Jim Richardson was built, has built his photographic career around visual storytelling by creating groundbreaking work in documentary, resource issues, environmental photography, and the critical concerns of feeding the planet. Before concentrating his working life at National Geographic for the last 30 plus years, he was noted for his innovative documentary narratives of rural life and adolescence that won him special recognition in the World Understanding Contest three times and the Crystal AMI for best multimedia presentation in the world in 1983. For National Geographic, he pioneered fresh visual narratives of water issues in the 1990s before beginning his work on food, agricultural development, and the problems surrounding feeding our growing and hungry planet. He speaks worldwide on food issues and his longtime fascination with the culture and landscape of Scotland. Among numerous awards, he is proudest that his fellow National Geographic photographers named him their photographer's photographer in 2014, and the people of Cuba, Kansas, population 186, named him their honored citizen. He is co-founder of Eyes on Earth, an educational initiative that seeks to inspire a new generation of visual storytellers for the Anthropocene era. In 2017, Kansas State University bestowed an honorary doctorate for his work in cultural and environmental communications, and Jim currently lives in Lindsburg, Kansas, where his work is featured at his gallery, Small World, on Lindsburg's Main Street. And I had the pleasure of first meeting Jim in person years ago at a photography workshop, but I had spoken to him previously on the phone when I cold called him after some prompting from Mike Forsberg to see if he had any tips on traveling through Scotland. And Jim at the time dropped whatever he was doing for a full hour long conversation with a complete stranger to offer advice as she set off for the adventure of a lifetime in Scotland. So since then, he has become a wonderful, sincere mentor and friend of the Platte Basin Time Lapse team, as well as a well of wisdom that we are all grateful to absorb whenever we are so lucky to have the chance. So we're glad to have Jim here. Thank you all for joining, and we'll just, I'll pass it on to you. Very good. Thank you, Carly. Thank you very much. I'm going to oh. use the, I'm going to use the microphone here. Hello, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, are you okay back there, Forsberg? Okay, good for you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. I want to thank particularly uh, the Plant Basin Time Lapse Project and Carly uh, making it possible for me to be here on campus, the uh, Department of Natural Resources, for letting me talk to smart people who care about natural resources. And uh, uh, I want to share a number of things with you today. But first, I thought I would, it might be interesting to unpack a couple of things you heard there in that introduction. Um, one, the Crystal AMI uh, goes back to the era. That was people who put together slideshows with carousel projectors. How many of you have ever actually seen a carousel projector? See, there are significant people out there who don't know what the hell we're talking about, you know. It was absolutely incredible technology that uh, was fraught with uh, potential disasters. And uh, anybody like Don Dahl sitting over there remembers the, the kind of disasters that could happen. Um, also, with an honorary degree from Kansas State University, there's a story to tell there that when I stopped going to class when I was a senior uh, second semester and went to work for the student newspaper, I turned out I was, 11, I was 13 hours short of a degree and I always swore I was going to go back and, and do those hours and get my degree. But they made a mistake. Um, several years later, they sent me a letter saying that my degree uh, requirements had changed. And now I was only 11 hours short. And that's not the kind of thing to tell somebody like me, because I just started thinking, well, how about if I wait them out? <laughs> and about 50 years later, it, it paid off and they gave me an honorary degree, you see? So there's a real lesson there in my book about how, how huffy you get about getting things done. So uh, 
what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about the business of communicating resources, science, all those kind of things. And I want to do it through the vehicle of sharing a number of stories, um, some of them longer, some of them shorter, that will talk about that kind of business, how you adapt your thinking to various stories, how you adapt the photography to the story to be told, um, how you find pictures, how you create the framework for uh, within which pictures can happen, um, all of those kind of things that that we as National Geographic photographers would would go through, and particularly the kind of stories that I did, which were always a bit obscure. Now, other photographers like Bill Allard got to go off and do stories like Paris, and he'd get to sit, you know, in some sidewalk cafe with a couple of beautiful women drinking white wine, you know, while I was at, uh, at a university lab chasing earthworms around petri dishes. Okay, so that's the kind of photography that I really got a buzz out of. Uh, but I also have always felt a bit of resentment for those kinds of photographers who could just go traipsing off to the Grand Canyon or someplace or another and just kind of hang around until they got a bunch of pictures. That wasn't what I was doing, and that's kind of what I want to share with you uh, today. So um, that turns into an obsession, that whole business. Every time you take on a story, it turns into an obsession, whether I was the person writing this story proposal or it had come from somebody else. It always turned into that narrow obsession. But I think that people think about the photographer doing these kind of things in terms of going to an exotic place where interesting things happen, where people go to the market out there in Hotan, out in the Xinjiang province of China, or you go and get to hang around Machu Picchu until the, until the llamas go by. You know, you're, you're basically out there, one with the world, uh, in, uh, uh, immersed in history, culture, whatever, you know, waiting for those great moments uh, to happen. Um, this is one of those uh, great moments that happened, a, a fire festival uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland. You know, I kind of like that kind of wild and weird stuff, which is why I always tried every once in a while to incorporate a story on something like the Celtic realm, which was my, my conjuring up of um, and reflected some of my Celtic heritage from uh, particularly my, my mother's side. But generally, just the whole thing of going someplace exotic, seeing something interesting, you know, and doing your photography or kind of thing, you know, waiting to, to, to push the button. I particularly like to show this picture, though, in this era, because this house between the rocks there on the coast of Brittany is very uh, instructive. Anybody who's a Photoshop jockey knows that you wouldn't actually have to go there. You wouldn't have to go to the trouble of actually going and finding that house, you know. If you just had a picture of a house and a picture of some boulders and some Photoshop skills, you could construct it all in Photoshop. You know, you could do it. And people do it all the time. You see it on Instagram forever. Um, but I like to point out that what would be missing in that picture, even if it looked exactly like that, is that there was somebody who we cannot see who thought it would be a good idea to stick a house between two rocks on the shore of Brittany. That's an essential part of this picture, something that we cannot see but we know is there, and it's probably the most intriguing part about the picture. It's that kind of thing, of, yeah, reality, how cool, you know? Reality, you know, that's what I'm really getting at then and a lot of these things is how do I go find that reality? What do I go stand in front of? You know, if you let me up on the, on the internet, you put Jim Richardson photography quote in there in Google, you'll get this quote from me in which I say, if you want to be a better photographer, stand in front of more interesting stuff. You know, it's a real shorthand kind of thing, you know, uh, meant to take the wind out of photographers who are very creative and think they can do it all by turning knobs. And what I want to say is, go find something interesting. Go find something 
the show. I mean, it's very prosaic, you know, when you'd like to get down to the, the nitty gritty of uh, the Freudian creativity uh, going on in your mind. And there you have a photographer standing in front of you saying, go find something interesting to stand in front of first and then get creative if you want, but make darn sure that we're sh you're showing something, showing something that either people have not seen in a certain way before or just have never gotten the chance to see. So yeah, it was great going out to Antarctica. I probably had a greater time uh, spending 40 years photographing those 200 people or so in Cuba, Kansas, because there was not the expectation that there was something real there. And if I tuned myself into it, I could see things, see things that other people hadn't seen and see things that I had not known how to see before. Had not known how to see before. And of course, then I got to go to a lot of other places. You know, This is down at the distillery at Boonhaven there on the Isle of Isla, and somebody thought to, to put one of those kegs out there and say, hey, you know, you've been to the best. You're just going to off to the rest of the world now, you know, and it's just another place. Well, tonight, this afternoon, I want to take you to some of those other places. So we're going to go through a bunch of stories. I'm going to go relatively quickly because it's the overall shape of things, not necessarily all the details of it that, are, that I want to talk about. And the Colorado River was one of my early early stories and it was a change for us because previous to that we would have done the Colorado River as an adventure story you would have gotten in a raft and you'd raft down the river and it would have been great fun and all all that but that was not the story we were doing when we did this in about 1990 we intended this to be a water resource story a water resource story about a valuable resource in the American West and why it was so uh, uh, problematic, why the use of the water is this. So I started trying to figure out how to do these things. And my picture editor, Dennis Dimmick, I said, you know, it's 1,500 miles of river. How do I decide where to go, what to see, what's, what's important? There's lots of things that are important. And Dennis had a great insight that I've used over and over again. He says, you're doing a 24 page story in National Geographic, that's 12 spreads. You can think of each of those spreads as being one thing that you want to say. What are the 12 things you get to say about the Colorado River? You know, that it comes from the mountains of, uh, uh, starts in the mountains of Colorado, that it's the only game in town when it comes to water in the dry southwest, that it, may, it never makes it to the sea. Well, it's, those are some kind of things. Once I had those ideas in mind, then I could go start looking for places where I could see them. You know, I could stand in front of something, you know. Uh, and so that one of them was that whole business of the, the plumbing you know, the big dams, Hoover Dam and all that. And so then it's kind of a, a little mind trick, a game of how can I photograph it in a way that hasn't been seen before? And right at that time, the technology came on that I could shoot at dusk with an F2 21 millimeter lens and brand new Kodachrome 200 film. You remember that, Don? That was a revelation. ISO 200, 200 you know from a helicopter. So I got a helicopter, the guy hovered for me there for 45 minutes as it got darker and darker and darker. And I had called up the operators of the dam that day and said, you know those, all, those big lights you've got on the dam? And they said, yeah. So, Could you turn them all a little early for me tonight? <laughs> and they did. And it was just absolutely amazing for me, this revelation that, you know, if you told people what you were trying to show, they would help you show it. You know, so they did, and we got that picture, which not only showed the dam, but also showed the the surrounding uh, landscape of the American the American Southwest. So I just told you one of those ideas. It's a it's a it's a only water resource in a dry land, and I found out that the All American Canal goes through an area of sand dunes out there in Arizona. So yeah, that's exactly the kind of place I'm going to go. Recreation is a real driver. 
So when I found out that they did this big party on Memorial Day, everybody goes out there with their boats in Copper Canyon um, and they get really drunk, you know? Okay, that's where I wanna be, man. Now that's exactly what I'm gonna go looking for to show those kinds of things or those campground scenes there uh, at Lake Powell with this, the evening storms blowing up in the dust and all that, all that kind of stuff, you know? I remember that picture because my camera stayed open longer than I thought it should have when I was shooting it. And when I got back to Washington, I was looking through all the film and I looked at that picture and I went in to talk to Dennis Dimmick about it. And my picture editor on the thing. And I said, did I shoot that? <laughs> and he said, yeah. <laughs> well, it was not what I expected to get. It was not what I expected to get, uh, think that I got when I was there but it was what came out of stretching further and further to try and make a picture that, that didn't just show it, just didn't report what it looked like, but got to the feeling of a dry land. So we yes, asked, I went down the river on, uh, on some boats, you know. Uh, this, was the, this was probably the best action picture I had, uh, but we didn't run it. We ran this picture because that's of Martin Litton. He's the guy who kept them from building dams in the Grand Canyon. So we didn't run the best picture. We ran the picture that had more to do with the issues. Finally, that's the Colorado River sinking into the sands in Mexico. Not a very good picture, actually. That's a really important picture for that, for that story. All the last of the water has gone off to can, uh, canals taking it to Mexican agricultural areas. And if they operate the Colorado River as they intend to, the Colorado River will never reach the sea again. That's a very significant thing to un understand. So very, in many ways, you're seeing pictures in here which weren't the best pictures. They're never, that's never gonna get on a gallery wall, folks. You know, It's never gonna win me a contest, but it is very essential to that story. Let's go on. All Grass Prairie, the Flint Hills uh, of Kansas. And this was a story that was essentially going to be w without people. It was a landscape story um, for our, uh, our series that we were doing on uh, national parks. And uh, I had written a proposal saying that there's this, this park out there, this preserve that, that people don't know much about. You know, uh, there were two audiences for this story. There were the people outside of Kansas who think Kansas is flat, which are, they're semi-correct, but not, not entirely, and an audience inside of Kansas who don't know the Flint Hills or something. I mean, I had people after this come up to me and see these pictures and say, you know, I drove by that pasture every day going to work and nobody ever told me it was something. <laughs> so. By doing the story in National Geographic, we get to say to them, hey, pay attention. This thing in your backyard, it's something, you know, pay attention to that. That's out on the uh, Conza Prairie out there uh, in Kansas. I had gone out before to do the pruning of the prairie in, uh, uh, the, Flint, in the Flint Hills. I had gone with the Hoi family um, who go out on horseback. You know, they kind of ride along with a box of, of diamond matches, you know, dropping matches in the fire. And they're really quite fun to do. You know, I like doing that, that kind of stuff. But what I wanted to do in this is, is a story of the seasons. Not spring, summer, fall, winter kind of seasons. I wanted it something more, a little bit more dramatic. So I determined it was going to be fire and death, rebirth, growth, those kind of almost biblical seasons, you know, something that would give a way of constructing a visual narrative. There wasn't just a bunch of pictures of this place thrown in there, but would have some sequencing to it. So as I'm out doing the fires, uh, when, they, when they do that in the Flint Hills there, um, from the air, every which way I could think of, of doing it. Uh, that probably was the most interesting picture that I got out of that kind, uh, kind of thing, but it didn't really have the, the flaming nature of it. So I think we used the, the first picture because in the sequencing of the story, what I understood was we needed to go from fire, the blackening of the hills, 
the death to Emerald Green five weeks later when the rebirth has happened and those areas that were totally blackened have come back uh, in abundant grass. I get particular pleasure showing people this picture in our gallery because they'll come in and they'll look a card at this, you know, and they'll say, what part of Ireland is that? <laughs> and I can say, it's not Ireland, it's Kansas. And then other people will come in from Kansas and they will say, you know, it's not really that green. And I can say to them, yeah, it's exactly that green. You need to go back and look at your home state. You need to go back and see what's, what's really there. So from the green to the abundant life coming back, the wildflowers everywhere, the storms coming through. I had, I had said in the story proposal that I would show them, you know, towering thunderclouds buttressed by lightning uh, with black tornadoes, uh, all that kind of stuff. I didn't get that picture. I got this picture of the storm coming through at about, it, it was there about two and a half minutes, you know, and I'm just frantically as a photographer zooming and doing every way I can think of doing that picture in the moment because this is the gift. This is, I'm, I have been given this moment. I chased it, but I've been given this moment to pull off this image, to say to people, you know, here is the wonder of those storms going across the prairie, or to be out there with the fireflies, just me and all those commingling fireflies out there as they swarm in their mating ritual out there. That one firefly, you see that guy blipping across there? That's one firefly. I got lucky on that one. He flew straight at me. He's uh, just a 76 second exposure and he's blinking as he goes. You know, I could kiss that firefly because he made the picture. Um, and I know it's a him because the fireflies up in the air are the males and they're signaling to the, uh, the females down below who are, who are signaling back, you know, they're flashing back in this. It's kind of like teenagers cruising Maine, you know, in a small town. It's, it's a spring lust ritual of sex is what it is out there. But it had this wonderful structure of color. So you see in the, in the visual narrative of it, one of the things I'm also worried about is going from orange to green to blue. I'm trying to think of ways that I can take a story which is gonna be pretty much all landscapes and make sure that it's got a visual narrative to have some pacing to it, you know, that kind of thing. I went out and did the, uh, the Milky Way there. This was early on when you could just barely do this with a digital camera about 2005. I went out and bought a Canon 5D and a 35.14 in order to be able to, to pull off that picture, lit that tree in there with a flashlight uh, in the middle of the night uh, so that I could do that. And got lucky out on the Cons of Prairie for a closing picture of, a, of the skin of a rattlesnake out there. All of those things, <clears throat> trying to find as many ways as I could to bring life to a place that is essentially going to be a bunch of, of landscapes, but really to elevate the perception of it for viewers who, as I said, either think Kansas is flat or it's not anything special. And that was some of our hometown folks. So every one of these stories, like when I got around to doing light pollution about three years later, came from somewhere. I came from Kansas. That's where the Flint Hills kind of came from. I came from a background of a, a kid on the farm who liked building telescopes. My uncle made him a telescope. He uh, showed me Saturn for the first time. Um, and I, I finally understood by about 2008 that digital technology was to the place that we could do a story on light pollution. Um, by then, the Nikon D3 had come out. I know I'm getting a little techy here, but the D3, and it could do ISO 6400 good enough that you could really do night scenes, you know? And so I did this, uh, I did this proposal to, to do light pollution. There you are looking down on uh, Central Park in, uh, in New York. But the first picture, the first picture that we led off with, I thought, had to be a picture of the glory, not of the loss. We had to establish for people who are not necessarily that familiar with what light pollution means or why they should care, 
Uh, it had to be a, a thing about the glorious night sky that we've lived with for as long as humans could perceive their world around them. Um, and all of a sudden, in the 150 years or so since Edison uh, invents the light bulb, we've raced towards obliterating it with too much light. So I went out to Natural Bridges National Monument, the first dark sky park in the United States to do that. Um, I've got the Milky Way coming up there. I've got a, a, one of the rangers, a young lad, uh, hiding behind that bush with a flashlight, lighting up the, the, the arch at night, you know. That, that ends up being our leadoff picture. And that ends up being the second picture behind it, showing Chicago at night. Uh, I tried several cities, uh, flying over several cities. Detroit didn't work, wrong colors. Um, Chicago worked. Chicago's got a grid pattern. It's got all sodium vapor light, so it's all one color. And I got really lucky. I thought it was, I thought it was a disaster when I saw the clouds when we got up in the air that night. But the clouds floating over it with breaks in there so that I could circle around and, and just get it when I could see the city down below. The clouds are what really ended up making it. So I had 30 days to shoot this story. And I decided I'd just drive it all. <laughs> I decided, I, so from, from my home in Kansas out to the West Coast, uh, back to Toronto in Canada, down to Florida, back, you know, I just drove the whole thing. I just figured, okay, here's what I can do. I'm gonna be in two kinds of places. Either I'm going to be in a place where it has dark skies and I can shoot the Milky Way and the glories of the night, or I'm going to be in a city or someplace that's got light pollution, and I can shoot light pollution. So I could go out in the evening. I can shoot from 8 until midnight or something like this, go home, sleep, get up the next day, drive 500 miles, shoot the next night. <laughs> and I just did that uh, along for about, uh, like I say, 30 days. This was a picture I got when I diverted from going to Chicago because the, the, the clouds were wrong. I went over to St. Louis, and there was a cloud layer above the arch. And it's all being lit by sodium vapor lights in the city. That's where the, the salmon color is coming from. Of course, our eyes correct that out. But that's what it really looks like. And then, of course, that whole thing, that's the thing that we do as humans, we put spotlights on our monuments and we fill up the night sky with light. Uh, so there are spotlights on the arch and the, spot, and the spotlights are creating shadows on the bottom of the cloud layer up there. That's why that, that picture came about. Because all these pictures for National Geographic, they're all going to have to be kind of page turners. They're going to have to say something. They have to say something real, but they also have to be pictures that, that we're going to be interested to see, hopefully interested enough that people will stop and read the captions. That's what I'm really trying to, to get to. So yeah, I went out to Bonneville Salt Flats, a place I'd been before, because I knew I could do those salt ridges out there. And I could probably see the city lights of Salt Lake City, 114 miles away. Uh, yeah, that was a, the point of that. Astronomers, and I went out to Mount Wilson. I, that was kind of a cool thing, because I'd always read about Mount Wilson and, and uh, the observatory and the discoveries of the redshift that happened there and all. So I went out there, found an astronomer who uh, had a, a dome with a telescope, and I could see the city down below. And I could see the city in the picture. It had to be together. You can't just kind of do a picture of a telescope and a picture of a city. And it's got to be in together if their picture is going to work. But that's not the picture we used. Turned out while I was there that somebody had gone out in 1908 and done a night shot of Los Angeles. And I could go find pretty much the same location and see it a century later. So that combination of pictures is what really get to people. That's when they, you, when they see those combinations, that's when it works. That's when it works. I went up to Toronto because uh, lots of birds kill themselves flying into skyscrapers at night by the light, you know. And they have a program where they go out and collect those birds that have died, and they put them in a freezer, and once a year they get them out and lay them all out. And I was going to be there when they were laying them all out. No. Um, and while I was there, I'm up on a ladder looking down on all this kind of stuff, got my light set up, school group comes in, didn't expect that, 
they all the kids gather around all the birds. Uh, one of the teachers says, who can show me the cardinal? All the kids point at the cardinal and bam, there's the, an added level of the, of the picture. I went back to Cuba, Kansas that I've been photographing for 40 years and I called up Dale at the grocery store and I said, Dale, do you think you, think you could turn out all the lights in Cuba so we could look, see what it looks like in a city without any lights on? And he said, yeah, I think we could make that happen. So, so they got out the electricians and everybody and they, uh, they turned off all the lights for me, <laughs> you know? Um, I probably, no other city in America could I have gone to with that request and have any chance at all of getting that, getting that to, uh, to happen. I went down to do the wildlife impact by doing the leatherback turtles there on Juneau Beach. And you know the problem, the turtles lay their eggs. They always come back to about within 100 feet of where they were, they were hatched themselves. And uh, they lay their eggs. The baby turtles are hatched. They're confused by the light. They go the wrong way. They get run over on the road back up there. So that, that's the, the light pollution component of that. I was down there with the, with the folks. And this is the turtle they hadn't seen before. So they said, would you like to name this turtle? And I said, yeah, I'll do that. And I said, I named it Kathy after my wife. And uh, I thought, this is very cool. She's going to be really happy with me. I went back and called her, and I said I'd named a turtle after her. And so somehow, she didn't think that was very cool at all. I don't know why. However, twice since I shot that picture, they've sent me emails and said Kathy came back. And the second time they came back, they had succeeded in getting the store, uh, the uh, the beachfront properties there to turn down the lights, essentially, you know? I don't think I can take credit for that, but it's a victory. It's one of those little victories that somehow or another is so very heartening. And then I went out to, to uh, Arizona because I'd found that there is a, a dark sky housing development, the first in America, Arizona Sky Village, and all the houses have telescope domes in there for all the astronomers who want to live there. You can only have a one red light outside. You can't have yard lights and all that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, this was Jack Newton. Uh, he's a supernova hunter from Canada who has a house there so he can do that. He'd been out there all night observing, came back, stood still for me for 30 seconds while I could do that picture of him outside of his house in there. They have a, a Milky Way Boulevard one of those lucky things, you know, you, you're not doing a story on light pollution, you find a place that's got Milky Way Boulevard. Cool. All right, I'll take those little gifts. So, yeah, Bill Lowler gets to do Paris, and I'm doing soil, okay? <laughs> but I came from a farm. I was one, one of the photographers who could say, soil matters. We should pay attention to soil. Let's see what we can, let's see what we can do. So, I went and found farms. This is the Coon Creek watershed. That was the worst erosion in America in the, um, about 1930. And that's where they first came in, the New Soil Erosion Service, uh, which became Soil Conservation Service, which become a NRDC. Is that right? Do I have that sequence right? Well, somebody probably actually knows here. Um, and that's the Mansky Farm and the old Arlen Mansky was about seven or eight years old uh, when they came out. He remembered when the bulldozers came out and they started putting in, in terraced uh, contour fields there, you know. And you look at it, what, 90 years later, and it's the picture of fertility, you know. So if we have problems in soil, we also have solutions. That's what I thought that was important to say. I went out to the Palouse for a landscape because that's a landscape where soil is essentially the author uh, of the landscape. You can get up there on Steptoe Butte and you can do those just incredible views of all these, these rolling, rolling hills of this lush soil. I went to Shanzi Province, which is probably the worst soil erosion in the world. So that's kind of how I'm trying, thinking about this. I'm like Colorado River Dennis's idea, you know, I'm thinking, what are we going to show? Where am I going to go to find it, you know? Shanxi province of China. That's an area <clears throat> near the Yellow River. This is why the Yellow River is yellow. Uh, it's uh, been eroding that way. I uh, see so those two farmers over in their field. 
went over and talked to them after this. And I said, do you have any problems with soil erosion around here? And they said, no, not here. <laughs> it's, it's one of the characteristics of soil erosion that it can happen so slowly, you don't know what you're losing. And this has been going on here for, well, 2000 years. So I had a great partner in crime in this. I was always looking for people who could help me out in the scientific world. This was Jerry Glover, who was at the Land Institute there. And he was doing these soil pits so that you could see in this example, you know, he could do a root wash there and you could see the difference in the root structure of wheat next to wheat grass. So it could be really be, see that side by side. We did, uh, we did soil pits out in Virgin Prairie so we can see the root structure down into, uh, into the soil. Did, Jerry was growing out sections of prairie in 55 gallon drums and then taking, digging them up, you know, so he could cut them apart and do a root wash and you could see all that. So we did that suspended in front of a backdrop and lit it with flashlights and strobes and all that kind of stuff. So I was looking for compelling visual effects, something that the audience could understand and grasp and that would really be a surprise for them. Come on there, son. So we did a lot of those. Jerry was growing out curly roots in PVC tubes that were about 10 feet long. Took about two years. So we had to be really planning ahead of it. So we did those kind of things, you know, there's some uh, switchgrass and a wheatgrass and a Kansas rosin wheat, you know. That's how we shot it. We laid them out on, they're 14 feet long, essentially, like four feet of grass and 10 feet of root. We laid it out on a 14 foot sheet of plexiglass, put the camera up there, shot it in 18 inch sections as we moved the prairie grasses underneath uh, the camera. And that's how we got all those, all those sections. I got the idea from thinking about a Xerox machine. Remember the Xerox machines and where the, where the platen moves, you know? And I thought, ah, I can do that. I can lay these things out and I can move it along and shoot it in sections so we get lots and lots of detail. When I show people those pictures that I just showed you of the grasses, it's not very impressive to them. They don't really get it. But if I do this, you know, all right, here we go, come on. If I do this, I say, we're just gonna take a little tour of some Indian grass. We're gonna start off four feet above ground, three feet above ground, Keep going down here because we're going to see the whole thing as we as it goes by. We're going to get down to the soil surface, and then we're going to be down in the root ball. The root ball is so dense that you can't hardly get your fingers into it. So when people see this, they start, oh, the, I get it. I understand why prairies don't erode. <laughs> because it, it's hard enough to get this soil out of there with a high-pressure hose. We're about five feet underground now, six feet, seven feet. Yeah, eight feet, because when we get to the very tippy tip down here, we're nine feet underground. With that, I can make an impression on people who have never seen prairie roots before. And there aren't many people who have pictures uh, like that. I also did soil fungi, you know, so when I give presentations, I can do this. I can show them soil fungi that I shot um, in, uh, in Petri dishes, you know, uh, but I can do this. I can say the number of species in one teaspoon of soil, 100 species of nematodes, 1,000 species of protozoa, 25,000 species of fungi, 75,000 species of bacteria, one teaspoon of soil. That's astounding numbers, and it makes a, such a big impression on people. And finally, what I did was I decided I needed to see all soil, a lot of different soil types around the world, and the soil scientist said I need to have pictures of all the major soil types, and I couldn't quite see that. So I finally decided I was going to do farmers with their soils. And I would do big soil pits around the world and do that pairing of the farmer with their soil. So there's Cletus Reed with his uh, grandson Sam out in Iowa. Anybody looks at that, they always get it. There's about 18 inches of, of uh, good, rich topsoil there. But 140 years ago, when they started farming there, they had 36 inches of topsoil, and the remaining soil has about 50% of its soil carbon. So 
we burned about 75% of the soil carbon uh, in, those, in those years. People don't like hearing it, but it, I, I sometimes tell them, this is kind of like slow motion strip mining is what we're doing. And we can't keep doing that forever, I'm sorry. Pedro Macedo with Terra Preta down in Brazil, uh, Farad Kalali uh, at Icrasat in Syria. People get it. This is really different soil situation. There's Mariama Abdullah, you know. People see that picture and they understand instantly why she is struggling to grow food for her children, where Cletus Reed can grow corn uh, in Iowa in abundance. That it's really, it's a really, when you can show these things kind of side by side like that, people understand uh, and they get it. This is a, this is a historical story, a cultural story, um, came about because I had gone out to the Shant Isles in Scotland to photograph puffins, and they belonged to an English author named Adam Nicholson, and I sent him some pictures after I got done taking the pictures of his puffins. He sent me a thank you note back and he said, oh, by the way, would National Geographic be interested in a new author? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know why. He says, this is the 400th anniversary of the translation of the King James Bible and I've written a book about it. And I said, I know, I read your book, it's really good. And he says, well, I think we ought to do a story. So I said, well, we can't do a religious story, but we can do a cultural or histor uh, 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 historical story, cultural influence, linguistic. Yeah, we can do that. So. So we did, and uh, um, the problem of shooting a story on a book <laughs> is that once you take one book picture, you're kind of done taking book pictures. Now you gotta think, oh, another 20 pages? What are we gonna do for that? <laughs> so, so yeah, so I made sure that the, that the book picture was, was, was kind of had some motion to it and it was kind of as exciting as I can make it. I had to go find King James. Found him at Hatfield House there in, uh, in uh, England, yeah. see the, little, the children back there, they're all laughing and everything. That, that was the bonus for me. They were on a tour and they were noticing that Adam and Eve didn't have any clothes on. So that's a, yeah, you never know, quite know what the extra element for the photo is uh, going to be. There were two, so I do all the, the research. I listened to Adam. There were two groups who wanted one translation of the Bible in England. The crown, because they wanted to keep the monopoly on the Church of England, all right, because it was very lucrative, all that. And the Puritans, who wanted to stamp out heresy. So I've got to figure out, where can I photograph that? So I went to Westminster Abbey to do the wealth, the wealth and the connection with the crown and the, and the, uh, uh, and the Church, of, uh, Church of England. I went out to a Church of Scotland in, on the Isle of Lewis, which is pretty close to it being Puritan. And there's no stained glass, there's no crosses, there's no pictures of Moses, you know, uh, any, anything like this. It's the book. And they have these hues with shelves so that as the minister is speaking or reading the Bible, you can follow along. That's what, so that, those two pictures side by side is what I really was looking for. Then I had to bring it up to the modern era and, and think of how am I going to show this stuff. So I went looking for a circuit writing minister. I found him through a guy who, who publishes the cowboy edition of the King James Bible. There's a guy out in Denver who does that, you know. And he sent me to Brother Rome Wager, who is the Lakota Sioux uh, book writer, movie stunt man, circuit writing minister who is 100% KJV, King James Version. And he was setting up a new church out there uh, around this stock tank. He does some, uh, and he does horsemanship sermons. He uses scripture from the King James Bible. He goes into an arena with a wild horse. 15 minutes later, the horse is lying on the ground. Five minutes later, he's uh, riding the horse around the arena, all while he's doing a sermon, doing, doing all this stuff. Then I remembered that, I don't know how I remembered this, the Rastafarians use the Bible, not just the Bible, they use the King James Version of the Bible uh, in their religion, which isn't really quite Christian. Um, so 
an influence, a carry on of it. And I did several pictures there uh, with the Babo Shante up in a mountain uh, retreat. This was the best picture by far. And my picture editor wanted to use this, uh, this picture. I argued that we should not use that picture. And we needed to do that picture because it actually showed them at noontime reading Psalms from the King James Bible. And I'm saying, this isn't a picture, this isn't about portraits of Rastafarians. This is about the King James Bible. We've got to do this picture. And uh, fortunately, it was one of those things that I won and we ran that picture. Unfortunately, the other picture is a nice picture. It's never seen the light of day. Sorry about that. Yeah, the way it goes. Neolithic man. I, oh man, I was growing up as a kid with stone circles in my mind from Stonehenge and all this. So, so the chance to do this up in up in Scotland was was absolutely wonderful. Orkney has more Neolithic stuff in the smaller area than any place else in the world. It's a it's a a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. You know, it's got places like Scarabray. When I was shooting that stuff. What I decided was that I was going to light it mostly with flashlights because what I wanted to do, I didn't want this to look like dusty archaeology. I wanted it to look like you shot it for architectural digest, that people live there, trendy people live there, and they just stepped out, you know, and they'll be back in just a little bit with some white wine, you know. Uh, no, I wanted that sort of sense that, you know, that these are real people. They, they really live, they had, they had a hearth there, they had beds on the side. There was a dresser. And when that thing blew out of a sand dune in 1850, after having been buried for about 4,500 years, there were still combs and brooches and things sitting on those shelves up there. It was very, very human. This was an era in which they were building tombs, putting things like eagle claws inside the tombs. This is a tomb that was found by a farmer up in Orkney. The archaeologist didn't come to dig to excavate it for 20 years, so he eventually trained himself to be an archaeologist and he excavated it himself. I, I love that kind of that that kind of story. And this is another tomb. This is Maze Howe Cairn. It's a chambered cairn and uh, and um, it was held a photograph because it it's big and wide and and it's hard to see. So I'm not gonna go into all the technical stuff, but I can tell you I have strobes inside all of those compartments and I'm varying the levels as I shoot. That's an eight picture stitched. I did eight pictures and then stitched it all together, lit it with flashlights, all, the, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's great, a chambered cairn though, is where they put the bones, but not the whole skeleton. This, wasn't a, this isn't a tomb. They would take in there and they would put Uncle Bob's skull over in this chamber, along with Aunt Dorothy's femur, you know, and they would have all these bones of various ancestors in there together. And then they would come up and mix them up, or they would take some out and bring other new ones in, you know. So what it tells you is we don't know what they were thinking about the afterlife, but they were sure thinking something, you know, as it were one of those great things. So this is the tomb at Maze Howe. If you go outside and look down on it, you see that's where it is. It's underneath that, it's in the middle of a hinge. A hinge is the round ditch and platform there. You can see it, if you go up the road about uh, two miles to the Ring of Broadger, there's another hinge. And the hinge was there 200 years before they put, started putting up stones. It was a sacred site long before they put up stones. The stones were not in the design, the stones were added later, uh, if, you, if you will. So I love all those kinds of things, trying to make connections of it. Here we are at the Stones of Stennis down the road with farmer Jimmy Tullock uh, and his dog Red, because he grazes the sheep in the middle of the stones, you see. I'm thinking, oh, this is a great opportunity to humanize this, pull it into the uh, modern era. A couple of years later, I ran into Jimmy and I said to him, you know, I didn't ask you, how is it you get to graze your sheep in the middle of the UNESCO World Heritage Site? And he said, oh, I own them. <laughs> he said, Jimmy, you mean you, you own those stones? How did that happen? He says, oh, they were on the farm when I bought it. So these are simply stones on a farm that, that 
that historic Scotland is taking care of. It's just all this history lying about. Right next to those, you go, if you're driving home in Orkney uh, after your work day, you drive across this little bridge, past another standing stone, past a farmhouse up there, and in the backyard of the farmhouse, turns out, was a Neolithic temple complex that they only started excavating about 15 years ago. And it was just absolutely massive. But you can, if you, the problem with archaeology sites and photographs is they look like a pile of rocks very often. So you can't make them out. So one of the things I was trying to do here was we came back at night and did the same place on a five minute time exposure. I've got a camera about 30 feet up on a pole with guy wires coming down. Uh, and we've got four of us with flashlights lighting it all up. So you can distinguish that house and all. As an as a extra thing though, you get people going driving on the road back there, you get the impression that, okay, so this ancient site is just down the road from where everybody goes, you know, for, out to dinner in the evening kind of thing, you know, that's the, the value of it. There's Nick Card, the head archeologist on a rain day and archeologists to hate rain days because of course they've got this whole crew digging and, and all that, you know. But this was, this was the pay dirt picture. This young woman, a student, had discovered, pulled up a stone, and underneath it was an ax head that somebody buried there intentionally 5,000 years ago, and she got to pull it out of the ground. And she was about to burst out of her skin in excitement. You know, That's the kind of thing where you get, re, I really get the payoff of the sense of adventure of being there. And then trying to bring little things like that uh, to life. That's a little one and three quarter inch high stone doll that somebody made 5,000 years ago. So what I'm trying to do there and all this, all this lighting and all these kind of things, you know, is to bring it to life. Make it so it doesn't look like an archaeology picture, but make it look like, you know, this is some cherished object. Uh, uh, they were doing many things like this. These are the pins that would hold your coat together. So what it says to me is they weren't living bad lives. They appreciated nice things. It's one of those things that I wanted to get across uh, in this story. And of course, then that's the stones of Stennis that we lit with my little flashlights out there in the evening. And that's how we ended up using it on uh, the cover of uh, National Geographic. I, uh, I will also say that this story started out to be the original proposal came in to be a story about underwater archaeology uh, in really muddy water. By the time we got done doing all these things, it was the number two story in the magazine that year. So I take some credit for taking a bunch of archaeology you know, and really trying to bring it to life in a way that would be interesting to people. Um, so some of these agricultural stories. Food heritage, this is uh, uh, Kerry Fowler, who is the brain behind that seed bank up in Svalbard in the Arctic. You know, I think I'm the only photographer who actually got Kerry Fowler bringing seeds to the seed vault in the Arctic. All the other pictures are, 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 are uh, architectural pictures of the building. I insisted that we had to have him and we had to have seeds because when you're doing a story like that, there's gonna be a lot of seed banks. And the problem with seed banks, they look like metal shells with glass jars on them. So you gotta find some better way of doing that. I did some of that by going to some of the seed banks like the USDA bank there in Iowa where they keep sunflowers. But if you're gonna do, you have to grow those seeds out, you know, every 15 years or something like this. Uh, and you can't let the bees go back and forth between the different varieties. So you have to have a cage for every variety of seed you're going out that year. And you have to have a beekeeper carrying bees back and forth between those, those things. Just that little discovery was what led to a picture like that. Went to Decorah, Iowa to see the, what they do at Seed Savers, uh, where they save all those, those, those varieties of vegetables. Set up a picture like this, but that was the payoff picture when I was there for Tomato Day. And they had 47 varieties of tomatoes uh, laid out and people 
people sampling them. Went down to Peru to uh, potato harvest up there at 14,000 feet in the, in the Andes. Really worked hard to do a picture of UG99 wheat stem rust. <laughs> this kind of the kind of stuff that will make your uh, head spin trying to figure out how you're going to do a picture uh, of that kind of thing. And when I got to Africa, I was looking for livestock things. I was fortunate to find Sheko cattle that when they found them, there were only about 2,400 left. And the Shekos are resistant to a disease spread by mosquitoes. So there's a little bit of, gen of genetics that's really worth saving. All of this was in this business about trying to make pictures that, that would work. Genetic engineering was another one of those kinds of stories. Which I'm trying to trying to do that kind of stuff. Here's some here's some uh, BT cotton, I believe. BT cotton. The plant on the left is treated with BT. The plant on the right is not, and therefore there you can see what's what's happening. So I was really looking for places where I could see the difference. the The big salmon is uh, a, a variety that has been genetically engineered. The smaller one is the same age. That's the difference in growth uh, in those salmon. Here was the problem of this story. Anytime you talk about genetic engineering, what you will always see in the magazine when they're doing a story about this stuff, you would see an arrow. You would see over on the left side is a jellyfish and over the right side is a corn plant, you know, and the gene gets transferred some magical way, you know, and I wanted to say, how do you do that? How do you actually do it? So I went and did a hell of a lot of digging, and I found out uh, they use a gene gun. They use a gene, anybody ever heard of a gene gun here? Yeah, <laughs> people haven't, haven't really realized that, okay? They actually blast little titanium pellets using a gene gun into the tissue of those leaves, like that woman's got grape leaves there, okay, into the tissue, and then they grow them out in tissue cultures, and they see if they took up the gene in the, in the right way. Um, originally, when they started, the, they, they had 22 caliber gene guns and 38 caliber gene guns. They were actually using blanks to, to provide the power uh, to do that. The scientist who originated that system, uh, the, the, was the first to transfer genes into potatoes, started out using a Crossman air pistol. That's how he pump it up two times and blast a potato with some of these things. Pump it up four times, blast it, you know. And that is how they invented the first process for implanting genes into things. Finally, I want to take you to the Hebrides just because this would be fun, you know. A story uh, heavily dependent upon geology, the landscapes, all those uh, wonderful places like the uh, Old Man of Store up there on Sky. This was going to be a non-people picture. It's going to be landscapes. So there's always a problem there of bringing this stuff to life, uh, enough life uh, to keep uh, readers interested in. This is great because those are volcanic cores that were exposed with this giant landslip slipped away. That bank that you see behind them back there, that's a giant landslip going away. Then you see the mountains off in the distance, another island off on the side. Had enough water and mountains and everything to get the idea of a set of islands. So finding the places. I started out by saying stand in front of stuff that's interesting. Finding a place like Uig Strand, which uh, is only about three or four feet deep, empties out totally twice a day at low tide, has just, just beautiful uh, view in the evening out there on the Isle of Harris. I went to Staffa to see Fingal's Cave. Fingal's Cave is this cave in a, in a columnar basalt island. Did this nice picture up there of Staffa looking at this little island on the side. As I'm shooting this, I know this isn't gonna be it. This, I've got to get inside the cave. So finally what I did, the problem with the cave is it's black basalt and it's a cave, so it gets darker and darker. And people have shot this picture ad infinitum. So I decided I'd go back there at night and go out in the early morning. I had a couple of guys uh, from the local hotel over on a neighboring island go with me. 
Uh, one of them was the pastry chef, and they have a big flashlights back there in the back of the cave. And as it gets lighter in the morning, blue light starts to come in on the basalt, and they were lighting up the cave with the flashlights from back inside of it, just that kind of thing. Went out to St. Kilda, which they abandoned in 1930 when the, they dwindled to 27 people. And what I really wanted to photograph was the neighboring island of Boray and all the birds there. I hired a boat so we could be there in the evening. It cost about 2,500 pounds. Got there and it was socked in. <laughs> well, there went my money. But as we came around, sunlight shone in, birds started flying out. I thought I got my picture. And that wasn't the picture, that's the picture. I had to have people convince me of that later, that that was so elemental and emotional that that's, that's the picture. Went to the Kalani Stones for sunset. This is another place that's been photographed over and over again. Uh, the sunset picture wouldn't do it. So I decided instead of going back to my hotel, I'll just stay. You know, I got out my little flash. I set it over on my camera bag. I used a little remote thing to, uh, to fire the flash uh, at night. Then I started shaking the camera while I fired the flash, doing these kind of things that might look like a would dissolve, belong on a uh, a Celtic music album. That's what it kind of kind of looked like. And then I did that for about an hour and a half. It's about two o'clock in the morning now, and I get out my little flashlight, uh, the little flashlight I've got over here in the bag, and I start lighting up the stones with the flashlight during thirty second exposure. So I light the stone on the right and left. And then I go hide behind that stone and I light up the stone in the center. And then a guy came down at about uh, 2.30 and wondered why somebody was running around with a flashlight in the middle of the stones. And I got him in a picture, lighting him up with the, the flashlight. Uh, Venus comes up, I'm learning more. I light the stone on the right, stone on the left, hide behind the stone on the right, light up the stone in the center, go hide behind the stone in the center and light up the stones back behind, all within 30 seconds of running through uh, the picture. Now I'm in the last seven or eight seconds, I'm lighting up the, the, the grass in the, in the uh, foreground there. And then finally, at about 3.45, I step outside the stones, set up again, and do that lighting. And that's the picture that we end up using. I start out in the evening. I don't have any idea how I'm going to do this. But I am going to keep at it with the idea that I'm going to try and elevate that place. So finally, I want to leave you with this. One, la one more, one more. I had always wanted to photograph one of those scenes where a farmer is hauling his sheep out for summer grazing. And I was out on Her Lewis. And they called me up and said, you know, uh, Jimmy Bannock is going to go haul the sheep out, go down to the dock. Got down there. He's loading sheep in this 150-year-old boat that he got from his grandfather, you know. I want you to keep an eye out on that lamb on the front thwart there because he's going to make a break for it. And he goes in the drink, you know. I just love Jimmy's. Uh, gesture there. Uh, no lambs were harmed in the filming of the sequence. They fished him out, okay? But it it is emblematic for me of the kind of opportunities that come to you when you keep looking. You keep looking for ways of telling stories, of communicating things to people that, they, that they've never seen before. It was a great gift for me when that, that lamb took the, the dive into the drink, and I only... Uh, I only show this to live audiences. I don't think we've ever published uh, this series of pictures. So I'm glad to be able to share it with you and some of the thoughts about my work. Thank you so much for taking the time to stay here with me. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, we can take some questions while we're still all in here. If anyone has questions. I know I'm running a little long. Sorry about that. <laughs> Too many good stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please. You speak of both flashlights and you do want to say it again. And you speak of both flashlights and strobes, which suggests to me that some are actual flashlights and the others are strobe lights, speed lights, speed lights. 
You, what, repeat for me. So for light, your light painting, mm -hmm. you're using both flashlight and strobe, off-camera strobe? Am I using both flashlights and strobes? Sometimes. Like, for instance, inside that tomb, I was using strobes to do some of it and flashlights to do other bits of it. You know, the fla it's flat, generally easier with the flashlights, but you only get a certain window of opportunity there before it gets too dark and the sky goes, uh, goes black uh, uh, and all that. But with the flashlight, you have great, great control. But that, like that Scarabray, the house, we did that two nights in a row um, because we, I didn't think we really got it on the first night. So yeah, and, and so <laughs> and it's not always that they're going to, you know, the the folks at National Trust of Scotland or Historic Scotland are going to let you in there two nights and pay overtime for their staff to be there and all the, all that kind of stuff. So, but uh, I think it's a really really important that that uh, you do everything you can to take those pictures, particularly if it's a place that's been been seen a lot. And really try uh, try and elevate it. I think I can claim that that picture elevated uh, that view of Scarabray because in the gift shop they now sell a refrigerator magnet with my picture on it. You know, <laughs> I've got the refrigerator magnet picture. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, please. I'm sorry, I've got bad ears, folks. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, the National Geographic is a great uh, medium in Africa. We watch it and we pay. It's not free. We do pay for it. I'm glad to you know to listen to a photographer from the National Geographic. Um, we do have a saying: the photo tells southern stories. So, in your case, do you tell a story before the photo, or do you wait for a story, a photo to tell a story? What I mean is that. Do you go out to take photo and do you wait for the photo to speak for themselves, or you just sit down today? I'm gonna go out this direction and get a photo that will communicate A, B, C. What you do? Give me that again. Sorry. So, what comes first? The photo. Hmm? What comes first? The, the first the, the, the photo. Do the, the ideas come first, or the photos come first? Um, yes. Can can be both. I can tell tell you this way. Um, you don't want uh, you don't want to depend on luck, so you do want to do your research. You do want to be going. I do want to be going, be going someplace that's loaded, that that any idiot could take a decent picture. And I hope I do a better picture. But, but yeah, I, I want to know that. I want to know that it's significant that there's something real to be seen there. Okay, then there are times in which you just plain out get lucky. Yeah, and oh yeah, so that. When you get done, then you, I think you are like a child with Lego blocks. You know how children with Lego blocks build stuff, and they decide, they discover that, oh, they wanted to build a, a, a Millennium Falcon, but they don't have the right nozzles or something like this. So they build what they can build with what they've got. When you start putting a picture story together, what you've got is a bunch of Lego blocks, all these pictures, and you build the story that you can build out of the pictures that you've got. Whether, you're not, whether or not you were smart enough to go get the, the right ones or you got lucky, you know. And sometimes you discover that you can tell a story that you did not anticipate you could tell. Sometimes you discover that, you know, um, reality imposed itself on me <laughs> and is trying to, to make me pay attention that what I thought was there was not, but something else was. I think it's worth paying attention when reality does that to you. If you, uh, because there are times, and, and there have been uh, times in which I thought some picture was there, and I got there, and it's just not as represented. You know, I no, it is not so, and I have to, you know, swallow my pride and say, and call back my editor and say. <clears throat> I don't think that's real. I don't think that what we were, I think we've been misrepresented or something like that, you know. Uh, and you just have to say, nope, let's go do, uh, let's go do something else. So it's a combination. Uh, it's a, it's more like a dance uh, than, uh, than a, uh, you know, outlining it uh, at first and just blasting through, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody had a question back here, I think. Yeah. 
How do you find people that are compelling to feature in your stories? How do you find people that are compelling? Okay. Um, well, used used to be uh, used to be when back in the in the era in which I was calling up people, you know, I'd be I would be trying to to ask people, you know, what am I what am I going to see? What's this person like? Um, all that kind of stuff. Um, a prime example was. I went out to the Isle of Muck in the Inner Hebrides because I had found a picture nowadays, nowadays, I found a picture online of the Laird of Muck named Lawrence McEwen, and he's got a face. And I just, uh, and he had both had a face and he had a story and people had done stories about him. And I reasoned that if I could get out there for a couple of days, I was pretty sure, you know, if I can make pictures in Cuba, Kansas, I could make picture of, of Lawrence McEwen on an island of 39 people. So, so that way. Other other times, though, it's just you know, sort of the the uh, the happenstance of of the situation. Um, I think, though, um, I don't think there is there's not one way. There are multiple ways that that those things happen. I think you can also you can also say you know I can I can kind of compartmentalize this. Uh, if, if let us say I'm shooting a story for National Geographic, this is totally unrealistic to the rest of the world, so bear with me. Um, and I'm shooting for 24 pages. I know that we're going to need uh, two or three pe people pictures in that space. I'm going to need this. The landmark uh, landscape pictures that set the scene. I kind of kind of know what I'm uh, what I'm I'm going for. That gives me some guidance of of who I who I can go looking for. What they what they uh, what pieces of the story they need to carry forth. You know that helps me uh, in in the understanding of of what I'm looking for. And sometimes that kind of understanding uh, it comes down to you need you need to be uh, your mind needs to be prepared enough that you can recognize it when you see it when it's right out in front of you. I can't tell you how many embarrassing times there have been in my life when I realized after I was there that that person was the key, and I didn't shoot him. I didn't shoot that picture. I could have, you know, and I didn't do it because I didn't realize that they were a linchpin in this whole story or something like that, you know. That happens way too much, you know. I wish it didn't. I wish I was one of those smart photographers who always knew, but I'm not. <laughs> so I have to kind of bludgeon my way through, <laughs> as, as, it, as it were. Uh, and, I, and I wish there was, I tell you what I wish is, 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 I wish I could stand here and tell you, this is how you do it, period. Uh, and I, I don't know that. I, I, I work my way through it from as many ways, uh, as many angles as I can to try and try and make it happen. And I worry a lot. I worry a lot, <laughs> worry a lot. Maybe Mr. Dahl, yes. One more. Years ago, you were a master of a database when you researched a story. Yeah. When you research a story now, how do you keep track of all of your ideas? Uh, all ideas yeah, and, yeah. and whatnot. I, I, uh, I still have those those databases. I was just showing a, a class yesterday uh, those those databases. Um, and uh, today I I tend to be a little more free form. I make us myself a, a document. One of the, because one of the things I can do like like the Orkney archaeology stuff there. Okay, what I did was I I would Google these places, and I would make a page full of pictures. That I had found of this, you know, of angles, of of times of day, of all this kind of stuff, and I would do it for the Ring of Bodger, the Stones of Stennis, um, uh, Maze How Tomb, uh, the uh, the the archaeological site up on um, Westray. You know, there are about about thirty of these sites, you know, and I would be collecting all that kind of stuff just as a metal reminder to me of what's there. Also so that when something goes wrong in one place, 
I've got a backup. If if all of a sudden they tell me I can't go into Mays How Tomb today, then I've got another one I can go to five miles down the road. I, I do that kind of stuff. Then I also just keep all the all the archaeologists and their phone numbers and emails and the the people who people who have bucket trucks, you know, bucket trucks so I can get up above stuff. Um, knowledgeable photographer over here nodding his head. Yes, bucket trucks. Uh, uh, who on the island has a drone if I need it? <laughs> no. Yeah, you know, who's got a small plane? Uh, you know, who's uh, Jimmy Tullock's phone number so I can call him up and see when he's moving sheep in the stones? You know, I just all that stuff. And it's always a very big uh, bunch of information. But the advantage of keeping all that is that over all those stories, I've still got all those contacts for all those people. And I can give, I can give uh, context to like caption writers, you know, so that they, they can, the publishers can, uh, can do things with this, with this stuff. So, all right. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, I was, I had two questions and huh? unrelated one is how long did you work on the small town doctor in Cuba? Oh, you know, I showed, I, I pulled out, this is from Cuba, Kansas, and I've been taking pictures there now probably 40 years. Um, the earliest to the latest pictures of that, I pulled those pictures together specifically to show you guys a, 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 a picture story. Uh, that was probably five years uh, from the time I first photographed him till they did the uh, the harvest festival around him and then two years later when he retired and died. Uh, uh, something like that. So, um, right. Great. Yeah, okay. My question is actually about National Geographic. Yeah. And I wonder if you could say anything about how it may have changed over the last few years. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she asked, has National Geographic changed much through the last few years? Well, it's always been changing, uh, you know, um, and uh, because for 30, 35 years, I would go back to Geographic to lay out stories and everybody would be in the hallways grumbling that it's just not what it used to be, you know, and that went on for 30 years. Um, but it but it it has changed, particularly in uh, the division when they when partners took the magazine and society kept all the all the funding and that went over to Fox and then Fox to well it's Disney now you know and I don't necessarily want to say that uh, like uh, people from Disney are meddling uh, in in the magazine but you do see this thing where they are very much more. Uh, tied together so they're trying to they're trying to take a story and also make a television series out of it and do it online and tie in with manufacturers or any advertisers or or, or those kind of things um, and uh, it's it's a radically different uh, publication uh, you, we used to be able to uh, think you know that uh, when we were doing things that there were maybe 120 photographers who worked for National Geographic on a regular basis and they would uh, they would be assigning five stories per issue, twelve issues a year. That's sixty stories through. Maybe they were signing seventy stories a year. Today, I doubt they assign ten stories a, day, a year. Everything else is coming from uh, grantees or stories they're picking up or God knows what. And it, and it necessarily changes things. And I can tell you one quick anecdote. I hope is quick. Um, years ago, there was a guy who was doing a story on the ivory trade, right? Um, and he was went to one of the photo festivals. He was shopping this story around. Everybody says, you don't have the picture of, of the ivory yet. You can't do this story without, you know, really having, having the, the tusk, you know? So six, he goes back six months later, he's showing up at National Geographic. He's got the tusk picture. He's got a, uh, a native coming out of the bush kind of, Hauling it, hauling a tusk. All right, and Geographic buys the story. Now that would never would have happened before. It would all these stories have been produced under the watchful eye of a picture editor who's looking at every frame. And when you look at every frame, you can tell when hijinks hijinks have been happening because you can kind of see the sequence and you can kind of tell. And you know, all of a sudden you're saying, "How come that man is 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 is, is in that boat?" And then you know those kind of things. Um, so they run it, all right? During layout, 
they had been using uh, a low res JPEG when they were doing layout, okay? And then they published it in the magazine at high resolution and some eagle eyed uh, reader looks, gets out his magnifying glass and he sees on the tusk, he sees a serial number from a museum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he had borrowed the tusk. Yeah. That would not have happened. Uh, I mean, there were mistakes made, but that would not have happened in the old days when you were doing that arduous research and fact checking. I mean, at National Geographic, when you got done with a story, your pictures went to the legend writers and the legend writers sent them back to all the subjects and they asked them, what's going on here? And is this real? I mean, they would ask that kind of stuff. Is this real? <laughs> uh, and so you know, as a photographer, you knew you couldn't really get away with uh, a lot of stuff. That's that level of, of arduous fact checking and uh, reporting does not exist uh, there anymore. I'm, I'm afraid to have to say if I want to be honest. So yeah. So thank you for the thanks. Thank, thanks for the question. I know I've kept you all a little late. Thank you so much for being here and, and uh, being part. Of this. Thank you.